for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Laura Abbott. I'm one of two Fedora kernel maintainers, the other being uh, Justin Forbes uh, right there. Uh, we are two full-time engineers at Red Hat whose job is to maintain the Fedora kernel. And uh, this is a session I called Fedora Process Review, but I really want, I don't have a whole lot of content to actually present because I was hoping to be able to get, feed, the purpose here is to get feedback and discussion for people who have topics um, they wanted to discuss. So. Uh, the way I want to run this session is to get a list of topics and then hopefully and then get an idea about where we want to want to start discussing for uh, the two hours. Okay, so um, who has a topic they would like to discuss? Okay. I know you do. Where did the cards? Okay. What do you want me to call your topic? Uh, the Okay. Um, any other one have a topic they'd like to discuss specifically? Don't make me say non USB webcams. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the purpose here is also to do processing. So, if there is a way the process can improve nine minutes of webcams, what sure. I know more about non Red Hat community engagement? What's yeah. there now versus not? How we can do better today? That's a good one. I'll probably start with that before we get to any of the other topics <coughs> and then. Um, and then I'm curious if the kernel is going to make use of any of these, this arbitrary branching stuff. Mm. <laughs> like if we're actually going to get multiple streams, whether anybody wants to think about that or not. <laughs> okay, this looks like um, a good set of topics. So I will start with going uh, an overview of some of the topics about how the kernel process works, and then um, we can go on to these. Um, then I think if there's no objections, I will just kind of go in order here. I will probably see if we can try and limit discussion on some of these to, I'd say, 20 minutes first, and then if there's still engagement, um, we can continue, continue going just so we don't get rat holed um, too much and we try and have a smooth flow. So. Okay, so um, I will, uh, for the people who are watching this recording, um, I'm sorry, this may not be a great session to try and watch remotely just because uh, it's intended to be a discussion session. Um, if people who are trying to talk would like to come up and use the microphone, we can, but I don't think this is going to be very effectively recorded, so I may just give up. Um, could everyone hear me when I was talking uh, without the microphone? Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, for those who are not familiar with the kernel process right now, uh, we Fedora the Fedora kernel is essentially like any other um, Fedora package. Is that we use a package git model where the package git has a, a list of sourcing and then a series of patches we apply on top of that. That's the model we use versus say having an exploded tree which has um, all the source file available to build. Um, uh, a lot of what Fedora does for the kernel is dictated by the way the kernel upstream process ends up working. Fedora's goal is to try and stay as close to the upstream uh, kernel version as possible. Uh, Rawhide is a snapshot of Linus Torvald's master branch. Basically, as soon as he patch uh, pushes anything out publicly, Rawhide will be giving it within uh, the next day or so. Um, so if you're running Rawhide, you're running the very latest kernel. Um, Fedora stable releases tend to get the last stable kernel. So for, as, for an example, the current kernel that's in the development cycle is 4.13. We are on RC7. Um, that's in Rawhide. Uh, Fedora 26 and 25 have uh, the 4.12, which is considered stable. And once 4.13 is released, um, and it's gone through a couple of kernel stable cycles, we will rebase that to for the Fedora kernel stable releases. Um, that generally tends to happen after a couple of stable releases. 
Um, that's the gist of it. Um, Justin, is there anything you want to chime in about the process? Um, a, a couple things. One is for, for people wondering when that rebate happens. A lot of people have heard that we rebate on DOT 2. Uh, it is true that we will probably never rebase before DOT 2, but sometimes it's way after. We don't have a firm policy on there other than we want to make sure that it's it's fairly sane. And a lot of times you'll see things discussed upstream as being not sane yet, so we'll wait till dot three or dot four. We waited till dot four with uh, four dot twelve and still had a few pretty major issues that I guess nobody noticed in broad in testing there. So there's not a firm set thing there. The other thing is, while we are like most packages that uh, use you know, source and patches apply those things. The internal mechanism for building the RPM, we actually use Git. So the kernel tree is exploded and, uh, as a new Git tree and then patches are added on top of that. Uh, it, it's helpful with a, a number of things, but the, the reason that it's important that everybody know this is if you submit a patch, um, that patch needs to be something that will actually apply with Git AM. If it doesn't apply with Git AM because it's missing the standard headers, uh, date, author, and subject, then we, we have, to, have to go back and fix it. What, what happens when I actually open a, how does the support work like? If I open a bug, take me through the process of how that bug actually gets fixed and what you guys do. Okay, I'll start with this. Um, it really depends on what kind of a uh, bug is out there. Generally, if it's something that I know how to fix or I think I have a reasonable attempt at knowing how to fix, I will take an effort, look the bug, uh, see if it's something that has been fixed upstream already, and if it is, great, that's made my day a lot easier, and I will um, be able to pull it in. But a lot of what we do sometimes is trying to figure out, is this what I call, like to call hardware independent, or is it hardware specific uh, problems? Just because hardware specific problems tend to be much more difficult to try and debug unless I either have knowledge about what might be going wrong with the hardware, or I have the hardware itself. Uh, software independent bugs are, um, hardware independent bugs are much easier to deal with if I can just get a specific test case. Um, it also depends on what kind of test case or reproducer there actually is. If there is a nice concrete, uh, say, script or program to run that demonstrates a problem, that also makes it a lot easier to things that are trying to work on. Um, uh, so that's roughly what I try and figure out. Um, Suspend resume bugs, unfortunately, a lot of times which are pretty popular, tend to be hardware specific, so those tend to get left to the side. Uh, I always try and tell people, if you can have a working and non-working kernel, and you can run git bisect to try and find a commit, that is incredibly helpful. Just be able to point to a specific commit and either report that to upstream or try and uh, look at it your, yourself is a great starting point to be able to get things fixed. Do you two report that step upstream, or would you direct the original reporters to report that upstream? Um, either. If uh, I always I encourage any Fedora community member who wants to report it upstream directly to go ahead and interact with the kernel community. Um, the kernel community has been not always known to be the most welcoming, but I still encourage people who decide if they choose to want to interact with the kernel community to interact with it. Um, it may in fact go better for them than they expect. Uh, so that or if for whatever reason someone doesn't have the time or the experience to want to do that, we can report the bug. The problem is is then you're a man and you're the person in the middle. All right. yes. you can do is relay and for back and forth. Yes, right. and, and that's time. Yeah, that, that that is a good point and one reason why I don't always like trying to report the bugs upstream just because it does feel like I'm just playing man in the middle in terms of trying to get reports and things like that. So and, and we have hundreds of bugs mm -hmm. and two people. So yeah. it does come to I mean there is a, a process of prioritizing, right? This is something that really needs to be addressed quickly and we need to try to get people on it or we need to fix it ourselves or uh, this is affecting one user that it, it's not critical, you know, his sound's not working right or something, but you know, we'll get to it if we can. Um, and we certainly are happy to, to monitor upstream and, and plan a patch if it fixes that, but it, it doesn't get I'm also curious, so I, I know it's just to people, and this is going to sound like a loaded or angry mm -hmm. question. I don't mean it that way at all. I mean this very introspectively. What do you two consider, you know, since it's just the two of you for a very fast-moving distro, what do you consider uh, doing a good job? 
Like, what does that mean to you two? Because it's probably different than the rest of the packagers. Um, well, uh, I'd probably say um, getting out, getting out a release that I'd probably say is booting on on everything is at least a good, pretty a, a starting point. This is seems like a low bar, but there are some bugs that will not be able to boot up um, at once. So I'd, I'd like to see that, and then I. My hope would be is, is that success would be on classes of common hardware. So the, mo the most popular laptops, the most popular servers, and things like that. If, that's, if those are working effectively, then um, I think that's a good notion of success. Because the problem is, is that there are two of us and we can't support every weird, quirky setup. Yeah, exactly. so you have an impossible job. Yeah. So, I, I, so there, there's been some focus on trying to make laptops works well, and I think that's really what I think is, is a good measure of success, is that for the common hardware out there that people actually want to run, is Fedora running well? I, and I would further that for saying, um, making sure CDEs are covered, yes. uh, making sure that as we do push out bugs, uh, we do push out, well, yes, we do push out bugs, because that's what, I mean, it happens every time on three bases but making sure that we are not pushing out major regressions. Uh, but that's the racket of software development. We create the bugs and then charge people to have them fixed. Yeah, but see, we don't get to charge people. So, <laughs> so I think that's probably a general overview of uh, the kernel process. And if there's nothing else major, I'd like to move on to topics. One quick question? Yes. How different is the Fedora kernel from the upstream kernel? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the Fedora, for Fedora kernel just carry, uh, tries to minimize the number of patches we carry on top of it. Usually the patches we tend to carry are a lot of what I think of are, are quirks to try and make things a little bit better that maybe upstream doesn't care about. Um, we do carry some large out of tree patch sets. Currently the biggest one is uh, secure boot, although we are making progress to get parts of that in. Uh, when ARM64 did not yet have ACPI support, we were carrying that out of tree. Um, so I like to think of, at the core level, Fedora is very is similar enough to upstream that you should be that we sh almost always report bugs and they are relevant to exactly um, what is up there. But we're all and the other thing is, is that we hope that the patches that we do have tend to be short lived. At least there's we get a lot of churn where say someone points out a bug and says this is there's been a fix from upstream. Can you bring this in? We bring it in and then maybe it drops out when it comes yeah. in with the next uh, stable release or two. Yeah, I see 84 packages on Fedora 26 and 56 in Rawhide. Yeah. yeah. It's the really kernel is not a lot, not at all. No, and really you have, um, like, the, the ARM64 stuff is moving really quick right now for hardware enablement and things like that. So a lot of times there are several patches that are grouped together in one patch there, but it seems that pretty much every rebase, as many leave as, many leave as are coming from so it's a, it's a pretty steady thing, but we're only carrying things that, that are best in front of hardware label. Okay. Anything else? How heavily used is the I386 I386 truck? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the people who use it, it's it's used by I'd say a handful of people who steadily use it. We are not seeing a lot of new uses of it, I would say. Um, as far as actual numbers go, it's hard to say. Yeah, how can you tell? Uh, from, from what we've heard, the check-ins, uh, so the, the largest number of check-ins on I386 is actually very old unsupported releases at this point. They're still running them, and they're still hitting repos because the automated process right. sees if there are updates, but they're not there. There are users, and there are some very vocal users, uh, but it's, uh, I, I would say it's probably a very small number. Certainly not on the scale of ARM or x 8664 Do you think ARM is more? It's much bigger. Oh, um, really? ARM is harder to measure, though, because of the, the types of devices those are. Sure. You know, you've got all these little ARM boards like uh, Raspberry Pi or whatever that you're, you know, I've got three of them in my house that are running music servers. They don't update. They don't check in, they don't update, because they're not connected, and uh, they're only connected internally, and there's no reason to do anything until I'm ready to reemit them with something else. All right. 
How are the good big options for the Colonel and Joseph in the store? Uh, we're actually going to spend some time um, talk, talking about that, uh, but the short answer is is that uh, we make a best guess effort um, when new options come in and we set them. Uh, a lot of the options that have been set have basically been sent there since they first came in, so many kernels ago. They have not really been reviewed, and one thing things um, Don's going to talk about is that what we're looking to try and do to hopefully improve some of the, the cycle about that and hopefully maybe get a little bit more review for people who care about. Uh, if you have an interest in any sort of um, con kernel config being turned on or off or adjusted, um, feel free to file a, a bugzilla. Uh, chances are, if it's, if we may not know why it's set, but if you can come up with a good argument why it should be set one way versus the other, we're happy to set it. Yeah, there are a lot, I mean, do we do have people occasionally say, can you enable this? And there was a valid reason for not enabling it when it came in. It was something that either came in through staging or came in as um, unstable or experimental and it wasn't turned on and then when it became stable uh, and supported, we never revisited that because it doesn't show up as a new option and nobody's asked for it. So. Well, my name is Don Zickas. I'm from Red Hat. I'm a kernel engineer. For those who don't know me, I do recognize about half the people in the room. <laughs> so, uh, one of the topics I want to talk about today was kernel testing. One of the new initiatives we're doing at Red Hat with uh, Atomic Ho uh, Fedora Host, Tom Fedora Atomic Host, the fast moving host mm -hmm. initiatives is uh, the kernel's going to be moving a lot faster. We want to make sure these things are stable. So, one of the things we want to do at Red Hat is to provide a lot of our uh, kernel testing. For Fedora, ideas to kind of help stabilize Fedora to support this initiative, this project. So Red Hat, as you probably know, we've had for years a lot of testing, internal testing that we put uh, on the way for uh, the rel kernels we produce. So we want to start moving that some of that to the public arena, start testing that on the Fedora kernels, and providing some value and community service back to uh, Fedora on, on that front there. Uh, to go a little bit further to help support it, we were looking to do kind of mimic what the Intel build bot does. For those who aren't familiar with it, uh, Linux kernel mailing list, they don't post a patch within four hours. Intel's got a machine that goes and takes your patch, builds it, and tells you if it builds properly on a variety of config options. We're looking to do something similar with uh, patches. We'll test them internally on our, our machines uh, and tell you that these patches uh, at least satisfy uh, we configure our kernel and provide and let the community hopefully fix those bugs early on rather than have them trickle down the door and have them get filed in language for a while. We think this would be, uh, help stabilize the Fedora community the kernels a lot better than they are today and provide us some, some value add to uh, uh, community service and stuff like that. So one of the projects we did kick off um, we put on Fedora is called SKT. Uh, I don't have a way to really write down that link, but on um, Fajur.io, I guess there's, uh, Jeff, how do we do it? it is, I think it's just SKT is a project name. Um, Sonic kernel testing, as we're calling it, and you, you should be able to, it, it's, it's very early in its prototype, but the idea was sort of it's gonna go take a mailing list, build kernels, and test them, and then report the results back. One of the, so that's one of the things we're hoping to do, and uh, hoping the community sees some value there, and with our testing efforts, we'll combine with Jeff's, Justin's work, we can uh, maybe get more engagement from the community to help run some of these tests on their machines and help report feedback. Yeah, it's just a figure.o slash skt if you yeah. want to write that up. I got it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and the, I think this gentleman over here, you asked a question about configs. One of the things that, uh, you know, Fedora. Justin and, and, and Laura are kind of overwhelmed with some of these configs sometimes. So a lot of times it's the best effort on the initial config and later on when the uh, community comes along saying we need this driver, we need this feature enabled, they'll ask for it. So one of the things we're trying to work on is having you know, Red Hat engineers get engaged in some of these configs and say, hey, you know what, from our experience we've learned these config options, if you tweak them with this setting, you get um, better value, better support. This, this feature is interesting, the community probably wants this. Um, 
these settings are probably a little bit better for the community, the community wants. So we're going to start hopefully providing value there and, and adding, uh, doing our own internal review and providing suggestions to the Fedora community. And uh, hopefully uh, they, they see value there and, and accept them. Otherwise, we can have a you know, conversation about the technical merits of that and stuff like that. So we're hoping to helping, you know, kind of offload some of that, that burden off Justin and Laura and, and put some you know, Red Hat internal folks uh, involved in that. I think that covers what I wanted. Any, any thoughts? Do you? What I should add? The next phase of, uh, of SKT with Bicep. Okay, so our SKT project right now is is pretty simple. It just kind of takes kernels, builds it um, internally, uh, and it runs a test suite on them on our, our machines. And of course, then if the test fails, one of the value add is to provide uh, an email feedback to kernel.org and have those guys, you know, like here's the test we had, here's the failure, can you guys help fix it? And the idea is if you get it early enough, people post the patch can respond appropriately. Um, this failure feedback only works if, if you can kind of, it works great in the patch per level, but if you're doing it on a, on a, on like a, a, Lin, a Linus kernel on a Git tree, sometimes you need to do a bisect on there. You gotta, you gotta start bisecting patches automatically. We're looking to build that logic into SPG to help with the failure case so you can narrow down and commit, respond appropriately so that it really helps engage the kernel.org folks to say, hey, look, okay, this is the exact commit. Here's the test that's failing. Okay, we can you know, logically think about what went wrong and produce, produce a corrected patch. I think you have a question back there. So, Don, is this separate then from Adam Williamson's open QA efforts and trying to automate all of that, or is that going to be built in with that framework, or you need other hardware? Uh, I think it's the same thing, except uh, I think we're using Red Hat resources, he's using Fedora resources. We, but I'll have to have that conversation with him, I think. Yeah, it's two different efforts. Two different efforts? At, at right now. Yeah. But they should be complementary. Um, yes, absolutely. So I actually was just talking to um, uh, Pierre right before I came in here. He's been working on some of that stuff too. And you know, it, it sounds like we can integrate all of this into uh, so they're complementary to each other. I'm sure we can. Yeah. I mean, well, we're, we're all so, so it's kind of a lead in question. So then my next one is do I need a name to talk to to make sure that they have hardware? Because I'm awfully interested in alternative hardware. Um, well, I mean, you obviously understand what, what, what hardware Red Hat has. Yep. So if, if you want folks like Adam to participate and run, you know, on public hardware, it's probably a good question to oh, ask. Will him. Adam be running the SKT then? Uh, as of today, I, I haven't had that conversation yeah, we, with him. We, we haven't gotten that far. Oh, yeah. um, All right, so well, I'll stay in contact with both sides. And so and let's take a step back. There's, there's running a test. What we're doing, SKT is going to do on, you know, Capturing upstream kernel uh, like like net next or maybe some Linus's tree, so we're catching different Git trees there, and then running tests. Whereas OpenQA may be taking a standard Red Hat or Fedora RPM and running tests on there. So at the end of the day, we're building something and running a test on there, and, and Adam might be running a similar test on a, a standard Fedora RPM. So he may never come around to running SKT, but maybe if I have a conversation, it, it might might make sense in his workflow. I have a, one, the, the Fedora requirements for CI CD um, say that the tests that, that we run in the Atomic Host pipeline and so on, they need to be available in Fedora or curated in Fedora. Right, so so that, that, will, that will make it probably a slightly different subset of testing. Also the hardware will be slightly different. Well, and there's um, additional so the way things. I'm seeing it is also that um, if we do gate, for example, every time you rebase, and we take a uh, large test suite and say, no, you can't rebase the kernel because it's gated and it has all these uh, problems, that's not, it's going to be right, but it's not going to be productive. So by, by going all the way upstream, we actually give the feedback to the people who can take action. And that's almost a prerequisite to then maybe even using exactly the same test suite to gate ourselves further downstream where hope by that point we'll have less to deal with, less gating, actual gating going on, right. even though the same test we have uh, occurs in. Yeah, and we do end up with cases where you know, sometimes we do have to push something. Right. So like the, the 4.12.5 update, we, the, when, we, when we first filed 4.12.4, nobody had, apparently nobody had been testing it live because there were some pretty major issues that nobody had noticed until then. Uh, but then by the time 
I got the, the first round of those fixed and, and I was uh, putting 4.12.5 out there. We had to push that because there were security fixes in there that were actually really critical. So yeah, QXL is still broken. There's a workaround for it, so it, it's not that critical that it's broken, but we had to push it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, so th actually that goes into one of the questions I have. So uh, SKT is available in figure now. Uh, but it is something that's going to be running internally, but the results of which will be made externally. So are those results being posted somewhere right now? Uh, right now it's done internally just to kind of get the pipeline established, but the, the goal is to kind of run public tests and somehow we'll find a way to put it public, publish results publicly. Yeah. Well, I'm sure Jeff can figure that out. And, okay. and for example, some of the problems we run into is when we take the ne next branch and the ne next branch fails, but it fails because it failed to boot because it's SCSI. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not necessarily a net next Problem. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to spam net next with SCSI failures. We want to send them to the person that we we do have a way for or we have a front end for the current test system that we're running in Fedora that uh, it takes log files based on, on kernel build and then it's got a, a status update. The status update on the front page is only updated from tests that are submitted from official test systems, not from anybody else. But you can click on a kernel version and you can see everybody who's run that test and submitted results, so you can see all the results. It doesn't tell you who they are, it just shows you a bunch of results there. There is a way that we could take the, the you know, uh, some sort of a log file summary output from this system and import it directly into there. So you can look at a kernel and, you know, so especially if we can, you know, find a way to, to mark it as this is SKT results, then you could just look and see. So that, that web page would be, it's a very crowdsourced way of getting kernel test results, right. even if, and some of which will be people and some of which will be in theory, bots. Right. Okay. So then my other question is, I guess this goes back. So let's say we get those results in there. One of the things that has, has still, it still confounds me a little bit on the Fedora side, and it's probably for Laura and Justin, is when you, when we find out that something is broken, how do we go about fixing those things, especially if there's gating in place, because there's only two of them. Yeah. So gating can become problematic there, like I said, for, for reasons like I just mentioned, right? You know, QXL, I didn't want to push out broken QXL. Yeah, but at that point we'd had enough built up, and there's a local loop that had to be fixed. Yeah. So uh, it, what we did initially, as soon as that showed up, you know, the first thing, it was posted upstream. We asked for, for help upstream. Mm -hmm. and we've gotten crickets. So now I'm bisecting myself. Yeah, that's well, the big yeah. problem. Is I think we we really <coughs> rely on um, upstream kernel developers who have uh, much more in-depth knowledge of all the subsystems. Um, the, the Fedora kernel maintainer role is kind of a generalist role, and you can only, we, just and I, we can only do so much, so we really do rely on that. But again, the problem is that if upstream doesn't respond, then we're kind of stuck with not knowing exactly what to do, so. And, and I know upstream has no sort of SLA, but like, what is the common expectation for a bug? Is it usually a month turnaround, six month turnaround, it, a week? A lot of times it depends on the severity of the bug. Um, and who yeah. it's irritating. Yeah, so some bugs, you know, we get less than 24 hour turnaround. Sometimes you will post something to the maintainer and they see it and say, oh yeah, hold on, I know exactly where that's coming from, and they give us a fix. Or, oh yeah, that's really serious, let me see what I can do there. How many times is that one of our guys? That's holding up the fix? No, that is doing the fix with a 24 hour turn. Like, because I know that we, you know, I, I don't know how many upstream maintainers we have within at redhat.com, but I know it's a bunch. Yep. I, I would say probably less than half. Really? Okay. Our guys. And it's not just, you know, it, it really comes to who's maintaining the code. A lot of times, if it's if it's driver stuff, uh, you know, it's, it's whoever's working on that driver. I know Red Hat's got a lot of networking folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah networking, networking stuff. And third um, stuff will be come from Red Hat, but yeah. outside of that, I think it's uh, the community. And there's some things that we just honestly don't triage, like ButterFS is, you know. I, I Do we even still have that enabled? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, Fedora has a very different approach than RHEL in that you know, we're going to enable as much as, as we can because people want to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and because we don't have support SLAs, then, you know, if it breaks, you can just ignore it. Right. So, uh, you know, ButterFS for a while was, hey, this is great. And then it's it's kind of gone in a different direction. So, um, you know, it's enabled, and I don't see us turning it off for any particular reason. But we also don't have resources to look at the bugs, and the resources upstream are um, 
frequently interested in other things, not the types of, of use case bugs that desktop users are seeing right now. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? So well, I guess what are like in terms of getting? I mean, did, did I guess just to, to go back to getting results into what was the thing you were talking about? The results. The kernel test. There's a an app called Kernel Test that Fedora app. So right now that we've got this other test suite that's a it's a quick test suite um, that users can run and that we run on everything. So it does things. Uh, it, it checks a few common cases. Um, unfortunately, we every time we ask for community help to submit tests, we uh, usually we'll get a couple people say, oh yeah, well, we'd, we'd love to do that. We'll write some tests and that's the last we hear of them. It's hard. Yeah. So it is. I mean, it, it, it's hard and it's not a high priority for a lot of people, but you know, hopefully this this will you know work better with all of that as well. Um, but right now users are running that and then submitting results and uh, we even actually hand out badges for people who run kernel tests for us, which is more of a motivator than you would think. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of people running tests just to get badges. And <laughs> it, it's cool. You know, then they run it on various hardware, and because you, you get increments in those badges, then there are people who test every kernel. Uh, and and that's, that's fantastic. So you if we can get something today. better out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all we have to do, though, to if there's some sort of a summary that comes out of these tests, some sort of a summary log file, then really we would just change, uh, we could change a header and do a slight change to the app and the, the database to take those results and, and add them and mark them. So does, does that sound like a reasonable endpoint? Yeah, so one of the things I just want to, people may not know, but specifically the kernel generalist team is contributing a lot of tests to this project called LTP. Um, if you look, you'll, you'll see a, a, a lot of brand new tests being added by Red Hat Associates. And Specifically, this is one of the ways that we're looking at using a, uh, a test suite LTP. So it may not go into like a Fedora um, diskit or an upstream diskit repo, um, but yet the LTP project is adding, we are adding tests directly to that, and that is one of the test suites that we will run. Mm -hmm. So indirectly, you get the test And these are one of the contributions we can make to Fedora is like, we'll help, I'm sure there's a, a wiki page or some sort of page upstream that says, how do you get involved in Fedora kernel testing? And we can add is how we run tests. We can you know, run with your test suite. We can tell them, explain how to run LTP tests and contribute results, and maybe we can run a thin, thin wrapper around LTP to kind of well, pull the results. Yeah, that's really all our test suite is. is it's a, a number of subdirectories that go through, and um, there's a run test.sh in that subdirectory, and it will, it, it can, it, there's no reason it can't pull down things, like even the, the NVIDIA driver test we have, just to make sure that it's working. Right, right. Um, actually checks to make sure that you have the local, the latest package downloaded. Uh -huh. And if it's not downloaded, then it'll go downloaded and it just extracts the kernel pieces to make sure that they build against that current kernel. Uh, it fails most of the time because we're testing on Rawhide and NVIDIA does a once a month release and only supports release kernels. So it fails a lot, but at least we know it's failing and know it's coming. So before before rebase happens, we can say uh, this, is, this is a concern. Uh, you know, obviously, we don't support that driver at all. But we know that people use it, so um, it would be very easy to say. All right, we'll grab all. Of them. Right now, we have some subsets of LTP, and it would, it would be easy to say. All right, uh, for people who want to run the more extensive test suite, grab all of LTP and run it. The, the good thing about LTP is you can create conf files, and the conf files is what you can execute with pan. So, you know, we can provide a conf file that you know, then when it gets executed, people can grab it. Mm -hmm. So this is just what we use. But Right. Yeah, sure. We could throw that file in the, you know, in the test in that yep. test suite. Yep. I've never yeah. seen this. Is, is this difficult to do the as test? a user to just to run these tests? I mean, you boot the get, get file check out the test and hit run test. Oh, okay. Now, if you want to actually submit, um, you, you, there is a config file that you'll have to say yes. I want to submit as authenticated because, um, and, and then there's a couple of other like, do you want to run? It? We don't run the third party module, the which right now is just the NVIDIA test by default. But if you change the config so that it does, um, that'll happen, and then we don't so do that. Let me ask you this: You know, obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of information you probably didn't realize where this is. And yeah. Where would you think to get this information? You think? Where would where, be an intuitive place to look? I go to the kernel channel in IRC and ask how I run tests. <laughs> I don't, you know, yeah. I mean, obviously there is a kernel wiki page. Yes. I use it when I need to remind myself how to properly build the 
product package with that. Would have had a link for how to test kernels. Would that be useful then? Or, uh, it it there might is, already. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's right one on to the there. bottom of it. Oh, is there? Oh. Yeah. There's also with the badge, you know, oh, the, the actual badge itself links back to it. And things no, like no. That. I, I hadn't heard of it either. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. Either. I mean, I knew that there was something in the back of my head that there was something relating to testing, but I yeah, just, you know. There's something we should maybe have you guys announce maybe once every six months. Hey, this is how you. Yeah, I mean, I guess we, we yeah. probably need to re-announce it. We did, like, yeah. sessions on plot with it, and there have been posts on the planet. And stuff. I, mean, should, I, I think that should go out with the, with the beta NGA announcements. I mean, yeah. you know, it's not going to take up more than a second, yeah. or more than a sentence or two. Yeah. Saying, yeah. Yeah. We can push all the idea. tests we want out there, but if, if people aren't aware of how easy this could be or how easy yeah. we're going to make it, then... I mean, I figured you could do it. I just figured it wasn't yeah. easy to do. Right, no, it's, it's a communication problem. We can fix it. Are the tests there known to be disruptive? No. Uh, well, all right, so uh -oh. the ones that are in there no, are not. A mix of answers, <laughs> which is terrible. The, 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 so the, the ones that are in there are not destructive. Okay. We have a Fair. directory for destructive options. Yes, there's a disclaimer that says it's to run the investigation might just be your The stress test. Oh, yeah. The, the, the stress test, you, you have to pass a flag to run destructive tests, but there aren't any actual destructive tests in there. So the, the stress test is different. Asking for obvious reasons, I don't want to get that. Can we ask, making the last question for now because Laura's got a couple other topics, and if we get through these, we can come back. And yeah, yeah, this has been really good discussion, and but I do want to make sure we get a chance to get to other things. Yeah. So, um, uh, I work for the Fedora QA team, and I wanted to say, I'm sorry, the, the Fedora QA team, okay. So, I wanted to say, uh, if there's a way by which we can have a kernel test day for release, so just after the mass rebuild and the rain date, uh, could we have a kernel test day? Yeah, specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah I used to run for vert. Um, we can do them. We would want to wait until like F27 is going to be based on on uh, 413. Mm -hmm. right, 414 won't release until after, so we'd want to wait until 413 was probably. Yes. RC6 is there. Uh, RC7 should be there. Yeah, RC7. I thought I should have been there, but um, I, I think in general the answer is is that yes, this sounds like a, a good idea. I think we'll just have to. Find a, a good time to do, do so. So that's yeah. a good suggestion. Sure. Yeah, I've, I'll, I'll set one up because we have yeah, rare preferred all the time before. So. Yeah. I do have a, a question, uh, maybe a suggestion. It sounds like that rawhide is the expected staging area where a kernel will go that is at the very minimum bootable, and then it's expected that people test it, find problems with it before we as we get rawhide in better state for all the other packages, that will become more a thing. Right now, everyone's just avoiding rawhide. We don't see that value. Um, Heard someone's working on it, though. Yeah. Well, actually, we, we test rawhide every night with OpenQA. And I'm sitting here thinking we'll just add these SKT tests or LTP into that wow. automated testing. Good. So, so the suggestion is that perhaps on the, on the where, where we send people to, digest them, to where they can engage with kernel testing, we have a status plot that says, here's how much of this test we passed so far, or here's some, is there some way of measuring progress? Because if it is green, we can gate on it by the time it gets to that point. Like, how, is there is there a, a subset of the tests that people run and then report bugs on their hardware, or some, some way of measuring progress? Sort of like how the translators have this, yay, we're, we're getting 90%, we're whatever. Right. So as it's in staging, people can feel a sense of, oh, I've helped make this go all the way over here. Uh, it depends on how the test suite works, depends on the architecture, the, the configurations, and so on. But if there was some way of measuring, okay, we're here, we don't know what it is, and we're getting all the way here, we're ready to go. E even if it's just like a chair, you know, the charity thermometer, we want to get 1,000 tests in it. Like yeah. Even that would be something. Yeah. That, I think that would actually be better because one of the problems we have is like all, our automated testing is in VMs. We don't have a lot of yeah. hardware right. that we have access to, and so that's why we want users running the test. Now, it's been a failure in that regard because we don't have any hardware specific tests at this point where it's very easy to write a test if you have a hardware to check for it, have certain hardware to check for specific things right um, if this module exists and is loaded then I'm going to run this test if it doesn't then I'm not and that way you can test all sorts of, of various hardware that way but the the idea is if we get people running it and then we also in, we end up getting tests for specific hardware things uh, specifically problematic hardware then you know you get people with varying 
mm-hmm. devices there running that test, doing giving feedback. All right, we uh, I know Boris got some other topics. Yeah. You might if I cut this off and just it's revisit the room. It's a two hour session too. So yeah, oh, it's a two oh, hour. It's, I'm it thinking it's one hour. No, it is a two hour session, but I wasn't sure how long. I mean, we could if we could definitely come back. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I don't want people falling asleep over this test. I mean, like how much more do people have want to have discuss the pod hobby? We could probably go another 10, 15 minutes before I'd like to cut it off and maybe have the well, last hour be up. And, and mine is actually very analogous to this. So if we wanted to hit the non rate engagement, we touched on it a little bit already. Yeah. You know, I can just go into what I, what I wanted to know there, really. Yeah, sure, that sounds so fine. we've got these tests supposedly in some future where we're now getting results and we're seeing things failing. Uh, it's an impossible test for you two to fix them. And so I'm trying to figure out, do we have any sort of kernel community in Fedora that we can engage and get to fixing these things, or is that the wrong place entirely? Would we just go straight to upstream somehow and hope that they would fix it? I've thought about this before, and for various reasons, I think it's difficult to try and engage the Fedora community to actually get, actually fix the bugs for um, it for most generic bugs. I I think this is because the Fedora community is best at, I think, reporting and testing on a wide variety of hardware, but I think kernel development in particular is covers such a wide wide variety of areas, it's hard to be able to know where to begin, even for Justin and I who do this as a full-time job sometimes. It's not an easy skill set to acquire. Yes. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it certainly is a skill set people can acquire if they're interested, but again, like you said, it's not easy. Um, and what tends to happen is you tend to learn how to do things for one particular area. So um, I think trying to, we wouldn't, I, I, I think we're not for lack of bug reports, certainly, but um, I think, I don't think we're I mean, It's safe to say just by like, you know, a handful of people in the community that are not really fixing arbitrary Fedora bugs, but more of like they're finding a piece of hardware they want uh, to enable or, or fix or get working, and then they'd spend all their time and push a bunch of patches upstream and want Fedora kernel backported. Yeah. Right. I'm thinking like what Hans to go. We, we do see that, that and yeah. we, oh. we do see, I mean, non-Red Hat people in the community who are you know, testing things all the time and, and do interact with upstream on, on behalf. It, it's just, it's a handful of people, but there are people who are actually actively making the Fedora kernel better uh, on the community side. We'd like to see more of that. Um, one of the biggest issues is, you know, triage. So we did a couple of years ago, well, several years ago, um, you know, Josh wrote up a whole, this is the triage process. And every once in a while, we'll have somebody come and say that they're interested in doing this. And uh, they'll spend a couple weeks and, and do a fantastic job, and then they disappear. Because it is the least sexy thing yeah. possible. I mean, we, we don't have a sexy job. So <laughs> I remember you said exactly the same thing two years ago in Rochester. And yeah. I went and tried to triage like five bugs. And it's the hardest thing. It really is. Yeah, it I is, mean, it's, it's just not, not easy. I mean, so so, so even if and I, I wanted to double check on this is an assumption I'm making, but even if someone did come in, find a bug that was open in Fedora, and submit a patch, like your charter is pretty much that that patch is going to have to be accepted upstream yep. at some point. So at that point, either you have to do it, or or the patch just sits there and merge because you're not going to merge it if it's not going to be upstream. At some well, point, right? we're not going to merge something that is not going to make it upstream. But bug fixes, typically, if they're submitted upstream, uh, yeah. will they will do one of two things. Either they will accept that and mm-hmm. fix the bug, and it, it'll show up in a tree. Unfortunately, because of some weird things in the way that the, the upstream maintainership works, it might not show up in a real tree until the next merge window, and then get backported to a stable. But right. We know where it's going at that point, and mm-hmm. we're happy to take a patch. Um, the other thing that happens is you'll you'll submit a fix, and yes, it fi- fixes an actual problem, but the maintainer says, I don't like the way that this is fixed. I would rather do it this way. Or I had something else in mind. Um, and, and in that case, a lot of times, we'll still take the patch because what they're doing is actually a rework that something that's not going to be backported to stable. But we take the patch with the, you know, this is going to be fixed in a completely different way next merge window. So, so as, as long as it's something that's going to be <coughs> going upstream, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, that's been my experience, too. I have worked through relatively recently a couple of NFS and one was doing some weird SCSI control of tape libraries that got broken. Right. And so yeah, I had never really done this stuff before and I learned how to do, I mean I didn't fix the bugs myself, but I learned to get enough information that I could get with upstream. In the NFS bug case, it was already fixed in 
one of the trees that was destined for the next merge window and that just had to filter its way back down and in the other case you know I mean I found where the it took me, it took me three days to bisect it server hardware is terrible to reboot constantly but eventually I found the commit that broke it and trace that back to upstream is actually once you have all the git information it's not hard to find these things it's just there's so much procedure and so many kernel recompiles it takes so long to do and it's, it's fun it's to difficult. have a tool to help you with that right yeah well i mean perhaps mm -hmm. i don't know i mean there was a continuous integration for, for upstream somebody the, the, the delorean thing that somebody was talking about yesterday that basically gives you at every commit point a downloadable package that you can then test so you don't as a, as a user just wanting to test these things out you can bisect by rpm not by and yeah. i mean for what we do in i mean the kernel it would just be impossible right but um you know i pull the daily git builds out of rawhide and it gives me enough information to get two bisect points so that i only had to compile my own kernel like 14 and you're and so you're yeah you're tape drive yeah. Because of the work you did in working mm -hmm. with, with the or the SCSI issue with the tape drive, yeah. because of the work you did in working with the maintainers upstream and getting that fixed, right. we had the fix out before we even tried to push the rebase. Right. So you saved anybody else from ever seeing that problem. Yeah. But not that anybody would have. I mean. They they may or may not yeah, have. You know, we been. don't, we don't know what hardware people have. Unfortunately, there used to be a, a tool that would collect that information. You could opt into. Yeah. And that went away, and there was supposed to be a replacement. Someone talked about it, BudCon and. That, that was seven years ago. That was yeah. Smolt. I invented yeah. Smolt. Yeah. I'll take some blame for that. But then I left to do OpenShift, so yeah. Smolt went away. Sorry about that. But guys. there's, but there's been no replacement. So it, it is, you know, a lot of these things. It is hard for us to say what everybody's running on because unless someone files a bug right. or yells, we don't really know. Other than through this little bitty check-in thing for Arch that is LSHW. sometimes. Yeah. We've been using that for Beaker now. We use the LSHW to uh, scan our machines to figure out what, what, what hardware's on there. We upload it to our database. So when, as the kernel developer, I mean, you want to test something. Figuring out how to do that, though, in a way that goes with through our proxy guidelines, though. Yeah. Is, yeah. Well, if it's opt-in, yeah. nobody yeah. will run it, but somebody will run it. If, especially if I've got the weird hardware that I want to make sure it doesn't disappear. Right. Then I have an incentive to run it, as long as I know it exists. Which yeah. I did run small, but... Yeah. No, we do get... You know, we can look at, at the... Uh, ABRT reports the, the tracebacks and say, all right, well, yes, a lot of people are running this hardware because it's, it's got that. bugs. Yeah. But I mean, I found ABRT to be noisy for the kernel in particular. This okay. is not to say the ABRT is not a useful tool, but I think for the way the kernel ends up going, it's by the time we actually collect enough data points to um, figure out exactly if one of these reports is something relevant we should fix, then we're mostly on to a new kernel, or it may have already been fixed in the latest version. Yeah. So, hey, ABRT is actually a very interesting question because the, the thing I was wondering about it seems to me if we add all this automation, if up until you'd mentioned ABRT, it felt like a lot of the the data that we got back was very artisanal. It's just kind of like somebody's somebody's got the weird hardware. I'm going to run my kernel test suite if I happen to know about it, or I'll log in and open a bug. Whereas if we're going to be starting generating a bunch of tests internally and other CI tests externally. Uh, my concern was, you know, how that I, I assume that the impact of that is that many more bugs are going to be opened upstream as well. So, like, if I'm on, if I'm, if I'm not involved with Red Hat at all, but I'm a kernel maintainer, presumably the odds of my seeing some sort of bug from Cor from Fedora somehow is increased. Like, we're going to find more bugs. But then, but then you mentioned ABRT. It seems like it, is ABRT like just generating noise at this point, or is it actually, do you guys follow up with those and file bugs upstream? Would you even know what to file? I, there, don't, I don't remember what you can There are some report. filters, there's some things that we can filter out. A, a lot of the ones you'll see though are things like um, out of tree drivers, mm -hmm. things yeah. like that, that they're, they're useless. Well, the tank, was, tank stuff, it automatically yeah. filters out, doesn't it? I was trying to follow it for a while, but I gave up because it was, I was not finding bugs where I could actually take action on. Um, sometimes what happened is, is that because the kernel does move so quickly, we'd find bugs. People were still running versions that were still out of date, but abort was still, ABRT was still reporting them. Um, we got, we were, a common one was graphics backtraces. Um, graphics is handled by uh, the dedicated Red Hat team who does a very good job but they also have their own stuff, so sometimes those bugs tend to stick around for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So I was 
not finding it a good use of my time to try and follow it. Now, I haven't actually checked on it in a while, so maybe things have changed, but it's... Not... Yeah, they haven't changed that much. Okay. Yeah, watching you, a lot of it. Do you think the, the process that Don is proposing, do you think it's going to generate a similar amount of noise to AVRT, or do you think it's going to be a higher quality set I, of information? I think it's going to be higher quality. ABRT tends to grab any sort of warning, any that comes up, which is okay, but on the other hand, this means that you're, we tend to get warnings for things like um, Wi-Fi driver timed out because it's got a mismatched firmware, your graphics driver timed out because something, whatever, whereas I, I'd say the tests that have been talked about before have been vetted, and so therefore I think they're likely to generate something we can actually take action on. We, we actually even have that. We're, we're carrying a couple of patches in the kernel. It doesn't fix all of them for essentially turning off warnings that upstream has said, we want to keep those warnings on because we want to, to know that this is happening. But the end user doesn't need to know and doesn't care because it doesn't actually impact their day to day. But it does show up in ABRT. Yeah, it shows up in ABRT. So we, we silenced a few of those, but that's only a couple of them. There's a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's expected behavior. The developers are aware of it. They don't want the warnings to go away. The user wouldn't even know about it if it weren't for ABRT. But but I, I think you have hit on a, a problem, though, in terms of things we see in the kernels, is that if typically if anyone sees anything that just um, says error in the kernel, they want to report it, which but the yeah. problem is that sometimes there's are innocuous errors. I think a good example is um, they did an upgrade of the ACPI table parsing code, and that's been generating some warnings. and. I think this is, be this is because there's a slight mismatch between the ACPI table parsing code and whatever ACPI tables there are. So this is not something that actually causes a problem, but because users see it as a warning, they want to report it. But that's a what value is? to fix because we see that on the rail side as well. We get, we get hardware partners who, who, who have actual money spent dealing with customers who, who report that as, as, a, as a bug that they're seeing and they're thinking it's causing their problem somewhere and it's not. But they think it is so it costs money to deal with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's a, uh, the, fix it. the amount of the num like the number per month of kernel related ABRT uh, posts that, that come into Bugzilla. Uh, I they mean, come in, they come like into Bugzilla across all releases probably just under 100 uh, on Bugzilla. Now, the, the thing is, ABRT is smart enough to not open a bug on one that's already opened a bug around. So the ABRT reports going up into the, the server right. um, are a lot more. Interesting. So I'm not, that's, I was just thinking, if, I guess it, it does, I've looked at it, I've looked at it, it does have some, uh, some uh, kind of machine learning techniques there already. But this is an area where we could apply some unsupervised classification. So you get an, a highlight, like of the biggest thing that people are running into. And if you dismiss it, then it doesn't really matter in the future. It's a warning. It's a, right. it's a thing. It, we start actually teaching a machine to go through the ABRT stuff and actually make it valuable. Yeah, that would yeah, there's, be awesome. there's a problem with that, though. Because you're assuming that people uh, won't be running somewhere, you know, I've, I've been in situations where people are running in labs and are running a hundred of the same machines and they all generate that same warning and that's going to offset your data. Right. So and as you, as you, uh, one of the, the interesting things that you do is you teach, we, we would have to obviously send up, so you teach it, like, I don't care about these kind of warning Stuff that's classified there that starts to learn about that and starts to see if you see a big jump all of a sudden, a hundred instances or a thousand instances of this. Then you start to, oh, okay, maybe that's worth investigating. We get some actual feedback. You can actually use that data. Right now, it just seems like useless. All the same. Every, a warning is treated the same as a crash and an oops and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. right. uh -huh. Whereas if we actually teach, uh, 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 put it into something like that, a structure like that. Now, the amount of data that we're talking about, let's say 100 bug with 100 different unique things per month, and I don't know if you bump that up in order of magnitude to say the number of instances. That's that's low for machine learning, I would say. So there's a challenge there, but uh, but yeah, if, especially if we if we do if we're able to take advantage of more data like that, we can definitely make something happen where 
Well, so that's it, it becomes useful. That's though. the difference between Bugzilla though and the the uh, retrace server, the actual server that, that collects right. all the ports. I can see quantities there. Okay. So if Bugzilla has this once, uh, you know, my local retrace and actually you know, it's happened seven thousand times in the past week. It just got reported to Bugzilla. Once. Right. So what percentage of uh, the ABRT reports are actual real bugs versus what I consider bogus warnings? Do, do you even know? We have just off the top of your head. It's not an actual. I'm not. I'm not holding you to a real number. But <laughs> just eyeballing. I honestly have no idea because I haven't looked at it in a while. You may have looked at it uh, more I recently. Mean, I, I look at them. It, it's very hard to quantify though for two reasons. Um, one is you'll have a, a user that files the bug because ABRT prompted them to do so, and then they disappear. So we don't know if they ever saw it again or if it was just. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this in a different way. There, we have a lot of splats and warnings that come out of the kernel because bad bot, it'll report right in there, bad BIOS. I, I, yeah. I'm asking about those. Are those not even a situation for you anymore? Where you guys, you guys sit, see it says, oh, this is because your system has a bad BIOS and it just jumps. Yeah, we, do, we tend to ignore those, yeah. Okay. We have uh, fair enough. I didn't know if that was causing you pain. Th th that is some of, of, of that. I'd probably say there was a while when we were getting a lot of warnings, which is which even had the warning said, um, your, bio, your, your bias, bias is big, you can I fix it. Exact warning you're talking and about then I submitted a patch basically saying, this is more or less saying, this is annoyingly yeah. me, let's just turn it into a print yeah. K. And yeah. the maintainer accepted it, so it went away. Yeah, right. But I've done that more than a few times now. Yeah. So. The, the other side of that, though, is we have, so there, there's a bug right now in the way that we are parsing. Well, I, I, do, I think the bug is actually in the firmware. It's all, all firmware from. Uh, yeah, oh, AMI, AMI who's that, yeah, that is running on laptops with hybrid graphics. Yeah. And what happens, you, you get into, a, in the way power state works, you can do an LSPCI and crash your machine. So remind you me know about this bug? Remind me to mail Felix about that. Right. So, um, <laughs> uh, actually, Peter, yeah. do you know about this bug? Yeah. I mean, you told me about it yesterday. Yeah, wait. You wanna well, I found out about it yesterday because we had a laptop that was locking up and the guy didn't know why. And he said it went away when I switched to NVIDIA binary drivers. And what he do? he had his laptop forced to use NVIDIA only at that point. Well, since then, it disabled the i915. He didn't have other graphics anymore. So we spent a little bit of time debugging and started looking. And there's a, there, there's a bug on kernel.org on how do we handle this. And the problem is it's not just this one HP laptop. It's HP, Asus, Dell, um, MSI, and a few other models, and the the workaround that works for different people, which was ACPI, OSI override, um, yeah, 2009 was the right fix for this particular laptop, Windows 2009. Uh, for others, it's just not 15. Gotcha. Or, yeah, not Windows 10. I, I, so I, I get it. Yeah. But it's all it's all based on the same bug, and it just depends on how it was implemented inside that particular firmware. So I, I kind of want to. I'm ten, I want to draw a picture real quick. Is that? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. We're dealing with a. I just realized we're dealing with a funnel. So I'm going to draw a funnel. I'll go back to the larger thing. So as it is, we've got something that looks roughly like this that comes in, and it kind of slinks down at the bottom. And basically, somewhere in here is where upstream happens. Somewhere in here is where the Fedora kernel is. Somewhere up here is just the reported bugs uh, that come in. So it's like the it's just Bugzilla, we'll call it. And then up here, we've got a few different classes of things that are going on. One is the artisanal reports that come in. Somebody report, a human being. Sure. Reports a bug, bespoke, reports a bug in there. We have ABRT, uh, which is some sort of little bot come in. Uh, reports bugs here. This is largely being ignored right now, it sounds like, because it's just very low quality bugs. There's not much you can do yeah. with it. I mean, sometimes. I mean, if it's something that a lot of people are hitting and we ask for more information and they respond, mm -hmm. then they will get looked at, but a lot of times they don't even respond. Well, I mean, it may be useful for statistical analysis or something. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a fire if, hose. So. If, if one month you've suddenly got an order of magnitude increase in ABRT things, then that's yeah. kind of like an all hands on deck. So then I guess, and then I guess we have, we have two others in here. One is th this new pipeline that we're talking about, a new, uh, you said LPT. I don't really know what to call this though. Like the, well, I guess I'll say SKT yeah. inputs, whatever, and that includes the LPT test and, LTB, yeah. and other stuff too. It's gonna go on DLRs. here. And then uh, this one was the, uh, you already have, what's the? The existing kernel test suite. Right? Kernel test suite, okay. And it's going in here. So at the very start, at the, 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 the top of the funnel, we have all of this, we have a lot of stuff coming in. And depending on what happens here, and here and here even, uh, this probably seems like a much smaller number to me like an actual physical person, but it's also the highest quality. Actually, I think you're going to see a much larger number there still, uh, ignoring ABRT, uh, com compared to the automated test suites. And the reason is the automated test suites are not running on near the variety of hardware that end users are. Mm -hmm. Right? There are thousands of models of laptops out there sure. and different models of computers that you know, they can have anything from just weird bias configurations to some sort of flaky hardware. We realized at one time a few years ago that there was a whole class of laptops that was made to hit a certain price point that after like six months of use they couldn't keep up with the thermal demands anymore because they that could, be, that could be filled yeah. in Bugzilla. How much did you yeah. spend on your yeah, laptop? Yeah, but it's seriously, <laughs> we, we, we finally realized it came down to just these few models and it was thermal issues. Are so, yeah, and how much human time was spent figuring that out? A lot. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So, and, and that's kind of where I'm getting into because this is a mix of this 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 is human input, but it's not us necessarily. This is right. coming from us. So we've got SKT, which in theory over time, this probably grows a little bit as we add more tests. I assume we're going to find more bugs. Uh, uh, this one here also grows over time as we get more users, and as does this. And so the funnel gets bigger. And my my big concern is what happens. Uh, basically in between here because we've got two people right now who are going to triage all of this stuff this goes back to, this really goes back to the triage question because if the goal of this if very very few bugs are going to be fixed here most of them are going to make it all the way to upstream hopefully get fixed by somebody else in a reasonable amount of time and then they get sent out to the world and so my question is if we greatly increase automation here uh, that seems like it's going to also greatly increase the amount of bugs that get tested here. And so, like, what I guess the question then goes to I me, mean, it seems like we're going to have a triage problem. And we I may already have that today. So I think one of the things is you, when you have upstream down the bottom, mm -hmm. SKT is going to also feed in directly there. Right? SKT will bypass the whole funnel and go straight to upstream. So, so it's going to do both. So yes. Y y yes. And, and, and we should be, the closer we get to the change, when the change happens, the more likelihood we are getting to have the developer that introduced that change to fix the problem. Right. Right. By the time he commits it upstream, a month goes by and it's merged in, and all of a sudden there's an issue and he's on to something else, it's a context switch and it's a problem. So as soon as we get the immediate feedback, as soon as we can give him that feedback, the more apt he's willing to, or she's willing to fix the problem. So then at least it's so solve the funnel problem. Right. Yeah, it, well, it, it, it solves parts of it because in theory, if, I mean, maybe we can. Uh, we haven't we haven't fully connected the dots between SKT and an actual Bugzilla part. I feel like we've got SKT going into some sort of result set that will be reviewed. Right. And it feels like at a minimum, if that result set's also going here, it's mostly a matter of waiting for upstream to fix it and then. Right. But so the, the goal is to win SKT is run because it's run on Linus's tree and it'll also be run on on next trees before they can get to Linus's tree. The idea is yes, SKT might be generating more data, but the number from people, your artisanal bugs, and your ABRT bugs should actually go down considerably because those bugs never actually make it to a shipping door product. But, and the other thing is I think the bugs that we will get will be much more actionable and concrete just because, and, I, and those will be able to get more attention from, I like even just in our eyes or, or, or upstream, for some reason they do make it further um, and we don't catch it then. Um, on, like I said, it's if someone manages to do a bisector and has a commit, that makes it a lot easier to look at things and be able to fix things out. I mean, I don't know all the kernel, but sometimes I can make a best guess effort of what might be going wrong. So. No. 
Okay, so then, then that may be a less of an issue. And then just another question. So this sounds like garbage to me, just in terms of how we talk about it. Is there any sort of time limit? On, like, do these auto close at some point, the ABRT bugs? When they're, that, when they're released into life. Is it? Well, no, actually, I take that back. So when we do a rebase, uh, we usually put out a mass bug filing to everybody. Mm -hmm. It's like, we rebase the kernel. Is this still an issue, still a problem for you? And we set everything to deep input. And if there's no response to that at all within two or three weeks, then the bug is closed. OK. So because we do, we would, you get a ton of people who file VRT bugs because they were prompted to do so, but then they don't even, I don't even know that they get the emails asking for further information. And, and the reason I ask that is because it feels like, you know, you two get involved basically right here is where you guys are. And so the smaller that, the smaller we can make this, obviously the better, but bugs are bugs. And so the, the next best thing is the highest quality information that we can feed to you guys, the better. And so if you're going to ignore, I guess my, my, my big question was, if you ignore a BRT just because there's only two of you, then do they go away at some point? Or does that mean that they just sit there and you have to, every time you pull the bug list up, you have to like ignore them again? Because that, that's work too. No, they go away. But you know, I also do most of my bugs all handling through email and not through. You know, I, I look at bugs that have been given updates in my email, you know, filtered for whatever release, like right now. Because I'm doing the 412 stuff, but that's on F25 and F26. So I'm looking at F25 and F26, and then at security. And you know, whatever's got unread, then I need to look at. Very rarely do I have time to go back and say, all right, well, I'm just going to crawl Bugzilla and see what's available. Mm -hmm. You know, see, see what needs to be looked at. Because I've hopefully taken a look at it when it came in. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. Doesn't that also mean you can't go on vacation? Uh, yeah, I went on vacation twice, and then you spend three days catching up. Okay, that counts. So, and then my, I guess my, my final question before I sit down, I guess, because I'm, I'm, I'm confused. So, does SKT, is that going to submit bug reports directly upstream, or is there some intermediary there, too, that just uh, reviews the results? Bug reports are yeah. word for it. I think it's more like, you know, patch feedback. It's like reviewing a patch, like, hey, we noticed your patch failed this test, or the public test, or the, the, the failure we got. Up to you if you want to do something. And that's up to the maintainer if you want to accept the patch. We're hoping that if we get it early enough, the sub maintainer will say, I'm, not, I'm rejecting this patch until you fix this. Yep. And okay. that would provide incentive for it to fix. Okay, that makes sense. And then the, the further on, with the human entering bugs, that it's always been the CI, CD, or just QE in general. The theory is that, you know, if a human submits a bug, you look at the bug, like, wow, we should have this test case in our test suite, expand your test suite, hoping that over time, that you catch these issues early on, there's less human reported bugs because. Yeah, but a lot of those human reported bugs are on, hey, I built this computer out of spare parts yeah. and something the, doesn't These guys work. are the slow churn butter bugs. Uh, that's what I yeah, I saw. I won't point that up. I'd say it's like spare ice cream. parts these <laughs> days <laughs> is that I bought this laptop and the manufacturer chose to use this really weird rated setup or chose right. to have a very questionable BIOS. Um, right. No, I mean, and, and sometimes it, there's legitimate bugs there. They're, uh, uh, they're I'm only, not you know, they're only that, triggered I, by, yeah. you can't say that the BIOS is to blame for every bug that originates in BIOS. Maybe we should be handling some of those, right? Actually, I can right now. Yeah. Every bug originates in BIOS. I yeah. just said. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, but it, we should be handling some of those things. No, right? no, they're, no, they're no I, I completely cases, agree. So. But, but, you know, I always say that part part of this bug reporting and, and triaging is teaching people to report better bugs. Right. How often do we do that? We do that all the time. Yeah. But the problem with teaching, though, is, is, is that, honestly, teaching itself is a little bit hard to, to do, and it, it, does, it doesn't scale when there are only two maintainers. Yeah. That's not to yeah, say yeah, that, I, I understand you know, that we shouldn't do that. And I mean, it's not yeah. that it's not valuable, but I'm yeah. saying it takes up time and energy. When so we have community so members who are willing to put in work, like, you know, we are happy to help you do that, and, yes. and you know, he's gotten two bucks fixed from 412 with that, right? So, yeah, you know, if, if community people are showing interest in putting effort, we're happy to take some time to help you do that. But we don't have time to, to go through every bug and... I said this years ago to the ABRT guys, the one thing I'd love to see attach those ABRT reports for the kernel with some listing of hardware, so we can compare it to what we have and figure out what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. I would love yeah. to get that. And so oh, there was can't we just have it run SOS? I'm not sure we need SOS. I'm wondering if we just need LS, LS hardware or something like that. Are you getting, uh, you know. Did you get pushback? Yeah. 
it was years ago. I remember when AVRT first came in, and it was actually reported that, like, we thought it was SOS report. Jeff, do you remember the, that? We were trying to figure out where the hell these things were coming from, and we went to the SOS report guys, and they were like, we have nothing to do with this, and then we discovered there was this whole new project uh, doing this. And yeah, we, <coughs> we at least got them to be able to pin down the warning, and because at one point they were just printing out one line of the panic. It was, it was pretty abysmal. All right. So uh, at that time, this was, year again, years ago. Maybe I should ask again and say, would you guys consider making it part of CC me on it, because I, I can. I, I mean, the worst thing they're going to say is, no, we think that's too invasive or something. The ABRT team seemed to be pretty uh, yeah. in, 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 in engagement for yeah. yeah, that sounds. I, again, this was five, six, seven years ago. So yeah, I never went back to it. We just need a quick hardware list, and we need you to turn on the camera and take a quick picture. Nothing <laughs> 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 major. <laughs> well, it really no, easy. And you could also, in the kernel test suite, say, would you like to report your hardware? The problem is we do have users who are using pre-release hardware because yeah, they're that. doing development stuff, so how do you handle that? Well, yeah. what's well, part of their, but I mean, ABRT is still prompts. Like, it's still part of the report, yeah. and those guys ought to know better. Oh, yeah. And well, if they don't, that's on them. Here's one thing that, I mean, doing the tiny amount of kernel bug triage I try to do. There's no standard format for people to use to report the hardware they have. I think Ubuntu has something like that. Like if you're going to report a kernel bug, please attach the output of this thing. Yeah. Right. And if we don't have anything like that that we can even ask somebody to run. I mean, I'm sure it exists as no, a tool. No, we, we have the tool. Yeah. I mean, we, we have tools that will collect information. I mean, but is, there a, is there a particular thing that someone is expected to type and attach when they, and the test the output of when they submit a kernel one. No. I mean, yeah. Maybe there should be. Yeah, that know. would be good. The, what the problem is, to give a, a default command would be collecting way more information than we would typically need on a typical, on, on a, any True. Bill. But I guess it's that's, that's in better, it's better to have it and not need it than need it yeah. than have it, right? So, I mean, yeah. Especially if it's not pasted in the bug, but it's attached. Oh, I, I disagree with that. <laughs> no, but, no, but users will complain that we're asking for Oh, well, they don't have to provide it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I actually used for is to be able to tell how broadly a certain kernel was tested with the hardware method. So you could tell, did this get tested for the same thing or on a whole bunch of stuff? If we had that as a, a reusable tool, not just for bug reports, but for example, for the test suite to also include in the results, then and, and it was a consistent identifier, at least for a given release. Mm -hmm. and you could kind of tell, okay, this is pretty well tested over 1,500 different configurations and so on. Yeah. Maybe if, if I'm going to the trouble of dealing with our Bugzilla and waiting for it to come up and typing in and going through the six steps that it takes to get to the point where I'm submitting the bug. He's making ice cream. Right. Then, surely, well, two things. One is, it's asking me for all the information that someone's going to ask me, so there's no more round trips. It's like, right. I gave you everything you need. Right. Um, but also, I've shown that I'm willing to give you information. Yeah. I mean, obviously. I've put in a hell of a lot more effort than that. I'm giving you my name. So, yeah. what PCI cards I have plugged in is not probably is going to bother anybody. The only thing that sucks about it, and I, it's just the people problem, too, is like, yeah. There, there might not be a worse communication medium than yeah. Mozilla. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the other part. <laughs> yeah. Mozilla is, is, is a communication mechanism at all as opposed to storage of data. Yes, it's, it's storage. Yeah. It's just wrong. It's, it's exactly wrong. Right. This has been um, a, a good yes. discussion, but I think yeah. um, if there was one more uh, to topic about arbitrary branching, yeah. so I'm going to say yeah. arbitrary branching, maybe come back to um, any other topics, and then I'd like to have the last 10, 15 minutes be a wrap up. So we can get maybe a summary of what we've talked about to do a readout tomorrow. Sure. Okay. So arbitrary branch branch away. I figured the answer to that is simply no, and then you move on. But <laughs> well, well, can, can you give a, just a background of that? <laughs> yeah, I want a background arbitrary branch. Yeah, 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 I don't know about that. So that was going to be so I, I, I can give a small background on it just because I was in the PESCO and we reviewed the ticket and approved it. Uh, as things have now moved from package DB to Azure. Um, one of the drivers for that is the ability to create an arbitrary branch, meaning a branch that is not F26, F27, F28, it can be anything. The uh, benefit to that has completely to do with the modularity and how they do their their builds. Um, they're doing special builds like that. 
and uh, I do not see any benefit on the kernel side of things at all for that. We do have an arbitrary branch called stabilization that we use every once in a while, but I, we haven't seen any. You, you couldn't do builds off of it. Uh, Nakoji wouldn't build off of it. We, we, you could generate an SRPM and do scratch builds, or you could build off of the covers. Uh, I don't see any reason to be using that in front of anything. Uh, I'm open to suggestion. Well, I mean, part of the, part of the reason why you don't need to is because I can take a rawhide kernel and stick it on a R23 machine and it works. Uh, yes and no. So you can, but if you have to, um, if you have to like build an outer tree module or something, mm -hmm. you've got a different color. You can't do it. I have a question. Mm -hmm. When you or Laura talk about PCs, you generally say, and I have such and so laptop that did this weird thing. But when Don or Kerr talk about PCs, they're probably thinking about some gnarly server that has huge peripherals hanging off of it. Is there like room for a server kernel versus a desktop kernel? Is no. That a use uh, uh, one? So there's there's two big components I think that that differentiate a server kernel. Uh, one is desktop kernel supporting a much wider variety of hardware, so we have a ton of models. You know, it doesn't take up a small amount of disk space, and servers don't care all that much. The ones who do are the people doing things like um, BERT and, the, and uh, stuff like that, and that's why we have kernel core, which should boot on any BERT system. Uh, and then we have kernel modules, which is basically the drivers for common hardware, and some even not so common hardware. And then we have kernel modules <coughs> extra, which is the. I mean, we're not sure that anybody actually uses this other than the one or two people who have to be turned off. Yeah. Um, so, really, one kernel can kind of serve those needs. The other thing that you see different is um, server is always going to prefer performance over power management. Workstation tends to prefer, prefer power management. Uh, and one of the things that we're planning on doing is going through and kind of auditing all of those. Uh, I think a lot of them can be changed at runtime. Uh, yeah, they're there. Yes, there are kernel config options, and we choose a default, but there are things that can be overridden at runtime. And it, it may be one of those things that we take to the server so you can say, hey, we should maybe yeah. consider making these changes uh, you know, for the, the server spin so that this works for right. Also, I would strongly caution against assuming that servers are going to prefer performance over power management if, if desktops or laptops are. I mean, it's these days, it's pretty much everything's going to prefer power management, historically unless you just have an unlimited budget. power budget. So, yeah, historically, but it's in the case that at this point you're building full data centers with that in mind. So yeah, so yeah. it's it's not what it, it, it even now it, it, it just isn't what it used to be. Everything pretty much wants the same, and weird hardware is not exclusive to desktops or servers. I mean, once you get down to you know, 400 gig Ethernet cards or something, it's right. that's still pretty weird. Yeah, so I mean, I, I still think either way it keeps it at a, it, I don't see much of a driver to build a separate kernel for the two. I think that we can we can kind of review config options and perhaps figure out you know, what what is tunable at runtime that would be best to do. Oh, okay. I have a scenario, if I may, to see if we can fit into the model of no arbitrary branching. And it, if that's the case, fair. You know, so let's just see if it works. Um, it seems like there's a stabilization model for the kernel, whereas for everything else, we're targeting a gating model. Where, well, we may, after the fact, send a bug saying you really broke something on um, performance, or you know, system D totally ruined the system that's been up for a thousand hours or ten thousand hours, whatever, right? That's hard to gate. But most of the stuff we're going to gate. Looks like the kernel is going to be hard to gate, right? So what if uh, the scenario? So a lot of what ifs, right? What if the atomic host says, we know the new kernel is not fit for purpose in the cloud or on you know, DigitalOcean or AWS or um, uh, another cloud. We're not going to ship that kernel until this changes. So we're at this point where they're going to essentially gate it. Mm -hmm. Very likely going to use a module to gate it. Now, they, could, they don't need an arbitrary branch to do that. They can refer to an older disk commit, disk git commit, that's what modules do, or use some mechanism to ship the older kernel. Well, the modular is who uses arbitrary branch. Right, but in but addition to modules, um, they can refer to an older commit and disk git. Like, the kernel doesn't have to have arbitrary branching for 
modules to do a little bit of their magic. On their um, so now you have a situation where for some time, uh, unknown period of time, hopefully not that long, but unknown period of time essentially has branched where we're shipping in a release of Fedora Atomic Host a kernel that you guys no longer really think, it, it has essentially branched in some way. And one could imagine that a security update comes and you're, so where, where, do, we, where do we do this? What do we do? Do we, you know, fix that? Slice in that security update for this kernel that's, that's now going on the Atomic Host. They haven't yet sort of jumped in. The, the other one's not stable enough. So I'm, I'm not saying all of these are givens. Right. Let's use that as an example to play around and make sure we have a good answer to it. Um, okay, so a couple things to there. When you when you say splice, are you referring to case splice K patch technology, or are you no. just using that as an? Uh, I just use that as a dumb word, but I meant patch. Okay. So the idea is that you would have to build and reboot. Mostly because I'm having a hard time imagining this is branching just because you're making it sound like, well, we're just going to pick up an older kernel, and that's not really branching. That's using an older kernel and then somehow expecting it to be supported. So the, the other side of that was now there needs to be a, a CV fix on top of that. Yeah. I mean... Well, that are really screwed. Right. So yeah. I mean, that, it this really is the whole worst case scenario. Maybe? This, this is your like Fedora support model that versus that your REL support model. I yeah. mean, that, that's kind of the way it works because, uh, you know, otherwise, if we start maintaining arbitrary bran branches for all this, there's two of us. Yeah. yeah it's not going to happen. I mean, I guess um, the question is, is, is that would, would it ever be possible to have a model such that other people could somehow have their own model? Well, that was the question I asked. How, how many of you, how many of you would there need to be for you to be comfortable? How many people you need to support multiple branches? Two people per branch. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I, I mean, yeah, <laughs> ideally, ideally it would be a person per branch. The problem is, um, we had three people. And, and Josh, well, someone else. It's not that good. Uh, the nice thing about having a three person rotation just for what we are is you did get a small break. Mm -hmm. Everyone's small, but you could go work on upstream stuff or work on the mm -hmm. testing initiative or things like that. And it mm -hmm. really helped with sanity. Uh, it's been like a year now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's no break. Yeah. So that's the that's the second most disturbing thing I've seen. I, I would like to see, you know, yeah, so if we can add another branch, probably another person per branch or a person per branch. Okay. Uh, for me, the, and I see the, my problem is I don't still don't know from a user perspective how this arbitrary branching is going to work. But I would you mentioned earlier that well, it's obviously no one tested the rawhide kernel because right. Well, there's a lot of times when I would test the rawhide kernel, but I don't want to test rawhide. Now I know that I can pull the rawhide kernel manually and and, and well, install it. But, but see, you're, you're one of the people who, who does. Test the raw, raw head kernel really frequently, and these are not problems that you know. These problems showed up in a rebase on 26. Sure. So it was that kernel on 26 that yeah. showed up. What I'm saying is we don't have the breadth of it. I mean, people who are right who are building their own modules and secure boot signing them and then throwing those keys in UFI. Yeah. It's probably a very small number of people. Yes. But you know, it would be nice if at least that had been tested. It's just uh, if there was an easy way for me to pin my Fedora 26 otherwise release machine to follow the kernel that you'd like me to be testing. Right. I would do that. I have no problem there, with there, that. There, I mean, I could always just reboot. Yeah. But there, well, there is a way to do that. You can go into your young config and mm -hmm. enable the raw, either the rawhide repo or if you really want to, the rawhide no debug repo. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, and rawhide no debug is kernel only anyway, so that's all you get. Yeah. Even if you want to do all of rawhide though, you can say kernel only. And right. it will exclude every other package. You do a, a DNF update and it will grab kernel from rawhide, provided it's newer. Yeah. Or if for some reason it were older, it would still grab it from yeah. 26. But it won't look for any other package there. But didn't you say earlier that there were, might have been problems with tool chain mismatches, though? So there can be problems with tool chain mismatches if you're, um, yeah, if, if, you're, if you want to build out a tree. Yeah, if you're you, you to build need out a little bit more than just kernel. Yeah. But that, and, and those rawhide kernels are. Signed and all of that mess. I mean, it the is. Or so the rawhide no debug kernels mm -hmm. are not signed. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, because uh, that comes from a separate repository, right? right? They're they're not signed. They're they're Koji Scratch builds. Uh, the actual rawhide kernels are signed and they're secure boot time. But they have the bug. No, the bug. Well, we, I fixed that bug. No, I mean they have the bugging symbols and all that. They do have the bugging symbols, but we did we made an effort, um, which is like a year and a half ago, to figure out what was making the bug kernels so slow, and we did turn on a couple of options to speed it up. So they're they are slower, but they're you know maybe five to ten percent slower. Than that. So it's not like it used to be where yeah, it, it was almost unusable. Yeah, right. yeah. Because yeah. I'm I'm sort of seeing. You know, problem, we have a lot of problems around testing. It's not just the kernel. You know, it would be really nice if there was one place someone could go to deal with testing uh, of their release. But that's not a topic here. It's just that there should be, if there was a place, there should be a checkbox for you. Give me the weirdest kernel possible. Right. And, you know, let me see how it works. Well, and we did just get a uh, suggestion uh, asking us to do a Fedora test day for kernel. Oh, yeah. Just like they do oh, test right. days yeah. for several other things, so I'm, I'm going to do that. Uh, I'll see if there's schedule, if there's time to schedule for F27, but um, certainly if not for F27, then we'll be doing it by F28. <coughs> we could even, we might even be able to s to do that on rebase, right? Yeah. If we do the week before relay rebase, I create images for people, or you can download the kernel from this oh, repository yeah. if you want to run it on your yeah. So that's something we could do to maybe get more people actively testing every major release. Because that's only once every three months. Yeah, I mean, what do you have to do for the copper repo that we just the new kernel stuff? Um, Without having to have a row hide and then the exclude thing and. Uh, well, we've, we've got raw hide node bug. Copper won't sign anyway, so it does, right. there's no difference between raw hide node bug and copper. Okay. Uh, the other thing, copper doesn't build as many architectures as doing Koji that way, and uh, Copper actually has, I don't know why they, they will not change it for us, their timeout value is exceptionally low, so we can only build x86-64. i686 oh. will fail because it times out after six hours. It just can't build it fast. Um, it's very oh. slow. Yeah, there's a very slow turn. Um, but in response to what you were saying, to me the most logical thing there is we have an issue that is is preventing a kernel from working on atomic. Uh, that shouldn't have to sit that long. That should be something that gets addressed before that. Right? You know, I, I understand if we've got an issue that's hitting one or two users somewhere because they're they have arbitrary hardware, but things are affecting a lot of users. Even this QXL bug has gone on a lot longer than I wanted to. Uh, part of that is because I had so many other things to deal with at the same time that I was I you know, it was lobbed upstream and let me see if I can do anything for one out of hand. So the, the mismatch, we'll, we'll just have to find a solution to this pragmatic one. The mismatch is that very likely, for some of those delivery mechanisms, they will gate at that point. It won't, like for example, if it breaks OpenShift, and it's a, you know, it's a, contain, a container-oriented host, and it breaks right. OpenShift, then they'll gate and keep in the old one. So then there's suddenly a window, and you're right, it's, it's important to fix it. There's suddenly a window where if a security update comes, well, we don't really have an answer, we're scrambled. Right. The other thing is, it's so the, the number of CBEs that come into the kernel are very large, actually. Yeah. Uh, multiple every week. Uh, but the number of those CBEs that actually would impact someone. Uh, right, because it's usually with X weird driver. It, it, well, it's weird driver. There is uh, like one I patched yesterday, I, I committed yesterday. I haven't done the build up yet. But it, it is a, you can crash the system by doing this to the driver that you shouldn't be able to do. You have to be root to do it. If I root, I can crash the system no matter what, so it doesn't matter. I mean, that, that's, I, I understand the way the security research community has gotten, but really that's not a critical fix, right? The root update that caused me to push uh, 4.12.5 with still a, what I consider a fairly major regression, if you look at it, um, that was a local root, and that's something that, yeah, a local user could gain root. That's something that, yes, we needed to push you. Um, it's been months since we've seen one of those, though. something about that scale. Well, usually they get their own website, marketing, and T-shirts, and everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, those are th yeah, those are more likely the remote route, but yeah. Well, th these days local route is remote route because we have OpenShift and stuff on user yeah. regions. So oh, I know. It's 
stuff already done. Yeah, right. The, no, the, those are treated with absolute priority. Right, because, and, yeah, but still. But those are few and far between. Those happen, you know, usually once. And what I would like to know is uh, sometimes those are in mm -hmm. um, which means somebody knows about them before we find out about them. <laughs> and I'm yeah, kind of wondering so if there's a way that, that we could find out about them to make sure that we're ready on day one. And, you know, if we know this is coming, uh, maybe we're not going to push a rebase Mm, a couple right. days before because we know that this is coming and we're going to want to do one last build. Because our um, process is long. Well, the, so the, the process is around some of that security stuff, around some very close list. And when I was at our path, I was actually on those lists. So you, sh you should, yeah, you should yeah. discuss with... Uh, we have security people on that list. It's just a matter of making sure that we get notified. Right. Such things. There's a thing. Yeah. I'll tell you what the thing is. No, no, I can't tell you what the thing is. I mean... Uh, there is no problem telling you yeah. in advance, in general. Right. Well, uh, Although just, just pragmatically speaking, there will be a problem if they fix it before no, REL does. They oh, no, they'll fix it in public. <laughs> oh, well, well yeah. a lot of times they we do get a fix out before REL does anyway, just because of, of how quickly we move through. I mean, let's, our, let's keep that on the down. Our, our QA side is <laughs> it's a quick thing. However, that fix <laughs> might also... one of those <laughs> bad analogies. <laughs> no, but, but that fix might also include some regressions. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Fedora there. fix is like... Yeah, the Fedora fix is there, but it's also part of a stable update that's got 130 some odd other patches that haven't been through any more QA than our people. Yeah. So this has been um, a good discussion, and I think we're probably going to open up the floor for the last time, but I just want to clarify, did you have further questions about the config process? I think it got touched on a little bit, but we did kind of gloss over it. Um, oh, no, just that it was best effort, and if you don't like them, then open button. Okay, yeah. I did want to clarify. It sounds like there's no explicit relationship between the Fedora config and the RHEL config, and that's intentional. But at the same time, uh, there's nothing preventing any changes from happening to the Fedora config if we can talk to you guys first. No, in, in fact, that's one of the things we've been talking about is how can we how can we leverage some of that? Because you know, there's two of us. There are a whole lot more RHEL kernel engineers, and we have people with specializations in all these different areas. When we make so a best guess effort, we would love it if somebody says, Actually, if you do this, you're well, going to... Well, I know for sure there are a couple of conflicts where I talk to other engineers and why do they only have this stupid setting? Mm -hmm. they, the problem is that even for within Red Hat, they don't know how to come to tell you, maybe you should set this this way. Right. So, so what, it, what would be the best way for you to get that feedback? Bugzilla. The Bugzilla, Bugzilla. Bugzilla for, for those types of things or the Fedora kernel mailing list. I don't want to. Yeah, okay. yeah, I see that. I but Bugzilla would be okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we, we would like to see it. That's the kind of things that probably should be uh, usually filed against Rawhide, and then they would trickle down and rebase. And there's yeah. certain things that, that we can't. Uh, some can pick up and actually will not trickle down. But some will. This is like a per perverse thing with kind of engineers that they don't have really a big incentive to send you bugs with them because they're using their own kernels. Well, that, that's why I'm. So yeah, <laughs> that's why I mentioned. The the call mailing list. If it's easier for you to send an email, if that gets us feedback, then yeah, we'll take the feedback because we we want to do what's best. But during the merge window, there's you know, sometimes dozens every day for like two weeks of new config options that kind of that we have to. Uh, uh, no, I'm talking about old config options, not that are new. Right. So that's the problem is we we take them when they right. come in, but then there's something that goes in reviews and later. So that uh, that's and some of that do change when it's new, when. New config option come and oh, you have this one, then maybe this old one should change now because right. whatever. It, every once in a while, that stuff got reviewed. Uh, we have three people go cry every once in a while, and then like you know, months or so. And it, it needs to happen. And we, we need to go through, you know, we've got drivers that we're supporting now, or you know, we just need to go through and turn off some of those um, the drivers that the hardware just doesn't exist in. Uh, well, it always exists. Well, it exists somewhere. Somebody will appear on the mailing <laughs> list to tell you it exists. But I'm sure. Well, but one way to know whether it exists or not, and turn it off. That's it it oh, and that's, that's what we had done in the past. Uh, you know, there have been passes where, hey, I'm turning off a whole bunch of stuff, and let's see who complains. And if somebody complains, they get turned off. Uh, you know, yeah. it, it happens in Rawhide, and then it happens to when the, when the t rebase gets pushed out to testing. Uh, but it, for those types of uh, for those types of things, what we typically do is just turn them off and run. And when when other kernels get rebased to that version, they don't carry those config changes. But when we do F28, 
then all of the testing through that is testing without those modules. So if somebody complains and says, hey, this worked in 27, but it doesn't work in 28, then we can, you know, all right, maybe we should turn that back on because somebody noticed. But yeah, then you had a whole bunch that got through with nobody noticed and nobody brought it up since. Yeah. I mean, people, we still have another half hour or so, so if people want to talk about, go back to any other topics about the testing or um, stuff, or can just be open floor for whatever for 20 minutes. Well, you've got to report something back tomorrow, right? Yeah. What, so do you have what you need for that? Um, I mean, if people want to work on that now, sure, I could. Report something back. Yeah, yeah Friday. Did this Friday. I mean, no, I mean, Friday is supposed to be like a readout of, of, yeah. these, of today's session. It's a summary. Yeah. I mean, so... As far as kernel testing goes, I think it was mostly report and feedback. I think it heard it, the what I heard was is that people were generally happy with the approach proposed about bringing in uh, the new kernel test suite to be able to to run. Um, uh, hopefully, this will be able to get it running on more uh, more hardware to be more hardware and be more people to be able to get that feedback. And then that kind of ties into the non Red Hat engagement in terms of um, just the bug bugzilla feedback loop where um, I don't think we necessarily got a lot of a action, but I think it sounds like that the, ho the hope is is that the testing will give us higher quality bugzillas and be able to put that in. Um, and there's also the really good idea about arranging a Fedora kernel test day uh, as well, so that's one of the big things they came out with. Um, see, and then for arbitrary branching, I think the conclusion is no, the kernel's not going to do it. Um, it's just too much work for us. Um, so I think that's what I have. If, if somebody, I, I really think if somebody were to provide like a very valid argument on why we should do one, then you know we, we might be able to entertain that. But our default policy is going to be no. Just like out of tree branches or I mean out of tree patch sets, right? Our default is no. If it's not yeah. going upstream very soon, we're not going to carry it. But sometimes there are cases we do. So. Probably also something that. This is a good discussion. I just want to clarify. Is there anything else anyone would like me to highlight in the summary? I, I would like to see it highlighted that Red Hat is apparently committing a decent number of resources to okay. testing Fedora, which mm -hmm. is kind of awesome. Yes, that's a very good point. I'll make sure I make that. Uh, okay. I will say the one thing I did not know coming in is that there's still only two people. Yep. Okay. They're magnificent people. Yes. Yeah. There is only two people. Okay, I will um, stop trying to run the show then and let you and let uh, y'all talk. So, my other question, the other one was probably for uh, for Dom. I think he stepped out. Do you, do you know when the SKT stuff is? Gonna, it sounds like we've got internal results coming. Do you know when they'll be external? We're trying to figure out because the problem we don't want to do is spam people. And you know, turn people off we, with, we're, with we're still in the testing phase is maybe the way to say it with this yeah. stuff to find out what the emails need to look like do they have all the information etc so we're just going to send them internal for a while and then so find them out. but just in a ballpark should I expect if I don't hear anything for should I expect weeks months a year uh, you know so I'll give you status in the roll-ups okay type of stuff but you know it should be weeks not months a lot of the details around this is, is scrubbing the logs, right? No, yes. You don't want to send everything that's in a console log in an email and have 90% of it be a with the same thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, I did have another question for Justin and Laura. Laura stepped up for a second. So with, with, I'm going back to the funnel, with the triage uh, and all that stuff, if you guys had like a very low level, almost intern level person, would that help you or would they get in your way? Well, um, that would probably help immensely. Yeah. Or, but, or triage type stuff. Yeah, that would help immensely. It, it's, I'm not saying that triage is trivial, but it doesn't require a high level. Um, we don't need 
consulting engineer. No, we don't need, you know, but it is very time consuming and yeah. it's very thankless. So, <laughs> the problem is if we had an intern to do it, you know, we're going to go through interns pretty quickly. Yeah. You're, you're basically well, asking people to give more information and they're like, well, I, and you know. also drilling down to the, okay, well, this is an ATI graphics book. Right, they so actually get assigned right. to yeah. and make sure the right people are CC'd on them or you know, stuff like that. Yeah, it's getting coffee, though. I, I would never turn down <laughs> and turn for a triage. Or, you know, I mean, my, part of my first job right out of college when I was learning to do kernel development, I spent a lot of time learning how to do bug triage, and it is very, it's, it's very valuable, and it's a good skill to learn how to have, and it's a great way to learn a lot, but you do also make sure there's the mentoring feedback to make sure you're not just throwing them out into the weeds, and they are learning something. Yeah. Okay. That person becomes the first person anybody talks to after they submit a bug. Unless they submit a really good bug. And those people are generally upset because they have to submit a kernel bug in the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, a lot of it, we were even thinking a lot of it's a higher level than that, right? It's just making sure that they're assigned to the right people that, yeah. see, uh, that see them and things like that. Sometimes you're not asking for more information. There's a decent amount of information there, but this is a, this is a I-915 bug, so I need to make sure that it's, because they, follow actually based on the, the XORG driver yeah. component instead of the kernel component. So if, even though it's a kernel problem, it gets assigned oh, there. That's a question. If there's really only two people and I found a bug in a sound driver, so we get CC to the sound people, which is... Well, there's that, a, right? I don't think we really employ sound people. Right, that's, I, mean, I mean, there is a separate line to CC, but I don't know who actually... No, it, it, yeah. it, that really needs to go upstream. Okay, yeah. So. And that's the worst part. Is and unless it's like sound that's in a laptop that a whole bunch of people have, yeah. you know, it probably needs to go to yeah. because there's no way they're going to do it. So um, I have one question. Um, kind of falls from the earlier point is, is there any level of testing that you would accept as gating before you, before uh, uh, automated testing? Yes, you would accept as gating before it goes into a non-rawhide So yes, like the, the test we have right now on the, um, what, to, to go to a non-rawhide stream? Yeah. We, we, we would consider a lot, I, or I would personally consider a lot more testing than going to a rawhide stream. Even a rawhide stream should be gated by what we're running right now on the, as the quick test on the independent, which is really, does it boot, does it, um, or is it signed correctly for a secure boot? Because unfortunately it's a problem. Sometimes uh, P sign flips out and we get signed with a Red Hat test key, which won't boot on people's systems. But uh, So we want to make sure that it boots, at least in a, in a VM, we want to make sure that it's signed by a you know, real key, a uh, couple of basic things. Well, that's where we start also with you know, plugging it into the pipeline with gate stuff. So yeah. Then we can work from there. We can well, I mean, like I said, that, that to me is even acceptable getting for all. I mean, if we want to talk maybe a step above that, I would say, can you do basic networking? I mean, can you think, think about a basic vir network virtualization? Um, do IP, do the, does the IP command work at all? Can so I even access the machine? Yes. Well, let me ask you a quick question. Is that, I'm sure you probably want a, a bigger test suite for the gate, but is the lack of tests, lack of time to write the test? Like if, if the Red Hat kernel team or the Red Hat team provides more public tests, which kind of help provide a bigger test suite, would that be more useful for you? Absolutely. I would love to see them, and I would actually yes, mm -hmm. I, I would take a large, a large number of those and say yes, these are critical enough that we would get a rebase for stable releases on them. That's good to know. Okay, then we can actually start to at least hook up the dots so that we can see how gating works, and then we can grow the tests from from what you have. I guess my one concern, though, would be how do we make sure we can, act if we find a gating problem, actually getting it fixed? I mean, the hope is, is that if we, the things we'd be finding we, would be fundamental enough that, say, kernel maintainers would, in fact, care, but, you know, who knows what they had for breakfast it's this so morning. Right. So you're it's almost like control in control over the test suite that gates. It's in, it's in, it's curated in yeah, your could, That's the model that well, well, is the theory, best, I guess. The more tests you have, the more bugs you potentially find, which means yeah. you need more people to fix them. You know, it's also hard in and of itself to say 
this bug is critical, this one isn't, right? Yeah. I don't know if there's a good answer for us to say, oh, we run LTP and random test X panics if we say, hey, we're gating on that, because that thing panics. Yeah. Right? It's going to take, at this point, it's going to take a human to eyeball that and say, what actually happened there, and is it is it gating? Yeah, I think that, that's a good point. I think right now, I think my opinion is, is that I mean, more tests are great. I, th I think you're right. We need the human gating and not auto gating and saying, sorry, you don't get to release. So, so the auto, so the way the gating works, I mean, there are some Fedora project gating that Adam was uh, talking about where, for example, if an upgrade doesn't work, Fedora doesn't even want to look at it, right? That's, that's enforced by policy in the project. On the package level, um, all the gating is essentially under your control. Yeah. If if you feel like that test is bullshit, or the kernel has changed sufficiently, or really all the odds are stacked against us, we have to get this out. It's a security vulnerability despite this, you get to change the test, disable one, boom, and it goes. The, the gating has changed based on what you right. want, to have, what you think is appropriate. Yeah, I, I mean, it, and I was, like I said, I wouldn't even mind seeing some of that on Rock. Mm -hmm. Right. To the point of, you know, we, we have to at least boot and we have to be signed. Good. So, yeah. Yeah, we already uh, have those for on, but. It would be nice if we could get just on that for rawhide because that way you're not sending out a, a absolutely kernel that and we have the, we have the power no we can <laughs> enable that within days right now awesome you have the test suite there we can actually make that okay great and then yeah for, for releases I would I would like to see much more thorough testing from, uh, and yeah and the next merge one is is going to be opening up soon so I'll be curious to see how effective the test is during the merge window versus out of the merge window well, so. It's going to open next week, though, isn't it? Yeah, next week or the week after. I can't see him opening it at Palmer's. I mean, this is also Labor Day weekend, so sometimes he gets lazy and decides he's not going to. <laughs> That's right. He, he might push it, because yeah, this weekend is Labor Day weekend, and then next weekend is, the next week is Plumbers. So yeah. if, if Plumbers is the first week of the merge window, that's going to suck. Yeah. It's going to suck for who, though? Us. For, well, it'll suck for us, and it, it sucks for, I mean, a lot of the maintainers are out of homers. Yeah. So, a lot of the people trying to push in things are out of homers. We have that problem right now with blocking the Compose, so that won't get done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it does have started to do in a way. Go through this week too. <laughs> All the people are in a room together, which is something that doesn't normally happen. You can lock them in a data center together. <laughs> <laughs> it's loud and cold. A lot of work gets committed to it. Not a lot of work. 